How's everybody doing today? I can say I'm doing better. I'm doing better. I'm amazed by modern medicine. Before we get into our lesson, let's take just a moment for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the beauty of this day, the way you've blessed us, enabled us to be here today. We pray, Father, we have assembled, prepared to worship and to study. We pray, Father, the things that we're about this day may please thee. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I want to back up and review just a little bit some of the things we've talked about this quarter. I don't know if y'all realize, about the same amount of time from Nehemiah entering Jerusalem to, to where we're at today in Nehemiah 10 is about the same amount of time that we've been in this Bible class this quarter. Now think about just review in your mind all the things that Nehemiah has accomplished in this amount of time. So just think about it. With the walls of people and the enemies and all the things that's gone on in those about 10 weeks. Now think about what we've accomplished in the last 10 weeks. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Not only has the city walls been transformed, the city itself, the walls built, the gates put up, the bars, it becomes secure again. But I think you're starting to see a transformation of something else. What's this other thing that we're seeing transform within this city? It's the people. You had to see it the last couple of weeks in these last few lessons, the people. Their different mindset, their different attitude, their different focus, they're just a whole different people. And one of the things you see that we're going to see a little bit more today in our lesson is what is causing this? What is causing these people? And one of the things you've got to understand, the same thing that causes these people to change is the same thing that changes people today. It's not somebody taking them by the shoulders and shaking them or taking them by the neck and, and, and abusing them. It's the Word of God. We've seen that word read and they stood for, for a week, half a day for a week. And listen to the word of God, and they cried. And, and, you know, and last week we seen where they, they, they you know, they, they just could They repented all day. They confessed their sins toward God. They see who they are. You know, when you look into the perfect law of liberty, what do you see? You see yourself or what you are, and that's what these people are starting to see. They looked at themselves through where they had been in captivity. They looked at themselves through the people riding about Jerusalem for so long. They forgot what they looked like and what God saw them as. And that's what we've got to see. We've got to see is how does God see me? And I think you're going to really focus on the fact that they've really got a pretty good picture of themselves today. I know there's a lot of names y'all had to read today. And I'm sure a lot of y'all was like me saying buttermilk a lot, but there was a lot of names there. And, I, <clears throat> and, then, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But last week as we looked at adoration, praise toward God, you see, you see them changing. They, say, they see where they've been, they see where they're at, and they kind of got an idea of where they're going now. Last week there was a verse, I think, that kind of encapsulated chapter number 9, and I just wanted to review it just for a moment. I think it says a lot to us today. Nehemiah says, Now therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who keeps covenants and steadfast love, let not all the covenant and steadfast love, let us not all, let all the hardships seem little unto you that has come unto us. Upon our kings, our princesses, our princes, our prophets, our fathers, and all the people since the time of the kings of the Assyrians until this day, yet... Yet, he's talking about God, you have not, you have been righteous in all that has come unto us, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. These people didn't resent a single thing that God had done to them for that 70 plus years of captivity because they understood. God had said, if you, do, if you live this way, this is what will happen. And they say the consequences was not because of God, it was because of their sin. And they, and they understand it. And that's what we have to understand today. The consequences that come our way are personally 
as a, as a congregation, as a city, as a nation, many times it's nobody's fault but mine. Today's lesson, we're talking about communication. And I know some of y'all read through this and you said, what about communication? Well, it, we're going to have to define the communication maybe in a way that you're not used to defining that word. No doubt when we, we hear the word communication today, we think about our speech, the things that we say. However, the word isn't limited to just speech. The dictionary defines communication as the giving of information, ideas, and feelings. In 1611, when the translators of the King James Version came across the Greek word, Greek word, well, koinona, it's K-O-I-N-O-N-E-O, -N -N -E a word which means to share with others. So it's a little bit different tilt on the word. The way they use communication was to share with others. Thus, to communicate with others is to give and to share. Often Paul talked about those who communicated with him, and he used that word quite often, I guess probably the most in their New Testament. He used that word in Galatians, Philippians, 1 Timothy, and Hebrews. No doubt Nehemiah understood how important giving or sharing was to the work of God. And we need to understand that today also. In the 10th chapter of Nehemiah, we find the people communicating to God and to Nehemiah how important the work of the Lord was to them. Now, not how important it was 10 weeks ago, how important it is today. And we have to ask the question from the Bremen brethren, brothers and sisters, how important is the work of the Lord to you today? They communicated the importance of the Lord's work by number one, their testimony. Number two, their time. And number three, their ties. And we're going to take a closer look at each one of these. Now the testimony we're talking about is not like the testimony if you were to go to one of our denominations and somebody would stand up and give it. That's not what we're talking about here, and you'll see that as we go through this lesson. The testimonies that they gave. The chapter opens, and the first part of this will be down verse 1 through verse 27 with all that list of names, and maybe into verse 29. The chapter opens with a long list of names, which I'm sure you all read every single one of them and pronounced properly. Of those who communicated to God and to Nehemiah that they, their commitment to the work. How many of y'all have ever signed a contract? You ever bought a house, bought a car, bought anything that wasn't yours at the time? You saw it and signed the contract. I get to sign contracts from time to time for things I purchase, and a lot of times it's things I'm committed to complete. And it's, it, it, do you ever feel the sense of urgency when you put that, start your name, you know, I start that J right there? Depending on how big the numbers are at the end, doesn't it? Well, at the end of this contract is a soul. These people signed their name. And the way they communicated was through the testimony that they gave. These individuals entered into a curse and to an oath. Now, they understood this quite well. When you disobey God, there's a curse associated with it. They just spent 70-plus years in captivity. They understood that. Maybe we don't understand that so well today because we haven't been taken off into Assyrian captivity or into Persian captivity. But these people understood it quite well. And an oath. You might say they gave their word that they would walk in the light. The oath that they, the oath that they took and the curse that they entered into reveals their understanding of the seriousness of what they were saying. And let's consider some of the promises they made as they signed this document. They promised to walk in God's law, verse 29, by their promise that they had admitted that they had not always walked or lived the way God had wanted to, them to. We find evidence of this in Leviticus 26, 40, 1 Kings eleven thirty three, 33, and 2 Kings 21, 29 through 22. They had been walking in the way that seemed right unto them rather than the way that was right unto God. Now, isn't that us a lot of what we do today? Sometimes we think, well, 
I know, God, that's what you said, but right now and under this circumstances, I think this is better. I just, you know, we say that to ourselves sometimes. We will kind of try to figure out a way around God's word or maybe under it or over it instead of going the way that God has told us to do. And these people have done this for generations, but now they see the consequences. Of, they really understand the consequences of going, bypassing God's law to do it their way. In like manner, we need for men to promise to walk in the ways of God today, to walk in the light rather than in the night. A battery's blinking. <clears throat> nope, no. Maybe I'm good. The first promise was walk in God's law, and we must do the same. Thank you, Jacob. <clears throat> you can't observe laws and commands you don't know. And we need to be in the book daily, often. Not only just reading it, but meditating on it. I know we don't use the word, and I say that often. We think about it. That's what we do in the South. I've got to think about it. And we need to do that often. That's why Bible classes such as this are so important. And our children being in Bible classes is essential. Thus the people were promising to pay close attention, pay close attention to what God said in his word. That's why they could stand there half a day or five hours a day and stand and hear God's word being. And, you know, they just didn't read the word. They made sense of it. They defined it, then they illustrated it. So the people understood, and sometimes we as teachers fail to do that. Sometimes we're good at just reading what it says, but sometimes we don't define it very well or illustrate it very well. And you don't have much to take out the door with you when you leave. You've got a lot of words, but how does that fit me today? What will I use that for tomorrow? How will I express that to my family and friends? And we as teachers need to understand that and be willing to communicate that it's also. That we can understand how am I going to use this to serve God. Today we need to have men to pay close attention to the words of God and to do all that they tell them to do. In Matthew 7, 21, it says, Not everyone that says, and says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of the Father which is in heaven. There are a lot of people that, you know, we, we think we know God. We know, we know God about as well as we know the president. We know him by name. We know their picture or whatever. But do we know them? Do we know him? Well, he wrote a whole book for us to understand him, to see him, to under, you know, understand all, all his attributes, and we see that, especially in our Old Testament. I mean, you see people dealing with God on a more direct basis than we do today because, you know, he, he 
took care of sin pretty rapidly in the Old Testament as he promised he would. He wasn't any surprises for these people. But it shouldn't have been anyway. In Colossians 3.17, Paul says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God through him. In word or deed. So that kind of covers it all. Everything that I say and every deed that I do, it's in accordance to what God would have me to do. And the only way I'll know that, know, do that is to know his word. So to think you're going to come here chat a couple of times a week and you'll get, you're going to get it all to know how to live perfectly before God and be righteous in judgment may be some misgivings on your part. So that is not going to get it. We've got to be in the word often enough to look like you'd want to be. I mean, it shouldn't look like somebody's got to encourage you to be. I mean, if you're going to reach the finish line to be acceptable, you'd want to be prepared. So here they walked in God's law. They observed his commandments. Number three, they promised not to arrange pagan marriages for their sons and daughters. And this is in verse number 30. For one of their major transgressions that they had committed was arranging marriages between children and the children of their pagan nations around them. We saw this in the very entrance into the promised land that started just right off the bat. Today, we must understand the dangers of such arrangements. These marriages brought problems to Noah in Genesis 6, to Nehemiah in Nehemiah 10. We see it also as he continues to do for the church today. What are we teaching our children? You know, the biggest, well, the second biggest decision anybody makes outside of becoming a Christian is who are they going to spend their life with from that point forward. Is that person going to help me to get to heaven or are they going to hinder me to get to heaven or prevent me from get to heaven? If that person is not sitting, you know, and I don't have to beat on this a lot because we've got enough examples here, enough people that will tell you which way it is accurately. Now, I grew up in a home and my dad didn't go to church. He became a Christian very late in life as many of y'all witnessed. You know, he, he was very old when he became a Christian. But that not going to church for my dad had a lot of influence on us five children. And not all of us are faithful. Now, what would have been better if he had been a Christian? Well, I, th I really believe it without a doubt it would have been better. Even more faithful. It makes a difference. Understand that, parents. It makes a difference who your children date and who they will marry. As we see here, and it was laid out so well in Nehemiah but because of the consequences that they suffered. Like these individuals, we have to give our word to God. When we obey the gospel, we become a bride of Christ. We made a commitment to be faithful to him and to act in the act of obeying the gospel. In Revelation 2, verse number 10, where it says, Do not fear... <clears throat> You are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. These choices, these decisions, these directions are not easy, but it still gives you a, a much better outcome. <clears throat> not only did he give us the word, but he gave us we are under a curse if we do not, do not keep his word. We became, we know, when you got married, all of you just married, you know you entered a covenant with that, with that spouse, a contract. Now we're, Christ is our bride. We enter a contract. Just as, just, just as big as this contract, these people on this day signed 2,500 years ago, and everybody signed it. Just not those names you'll read down, all the women and all the children that could understand. They all was a part of this covenant or this contract or this communication with God and Nehemiah. We entered into the same contract when we became a Christian. To be faithful unto death, to earn that crown, we need to take that just as seriously as we took our own marriage vows when we became married to our spouse, even more seriously. Next, they gave their time. They gave their time. In addition to giving their word, which they signed the contract, the oath, and the curse, 
they gave their time. They promised that if the people of the land brought up goods to sell on the Sabbath day, which they usually did, Sabbath day was just like it is in America today, it was just another day to go to Walmart, <clears throat> on any or on another holy day, they would not buy them. Now, why was that important? It was important because God told them not to. That was his day, the Sabbath. That was their day that he had set aside for certain things, worship and rest. Further, they promised that they would, not, they would observe the sabbatical, sabbatical years. We read in this in 31. Every seventh year they were to, to lay their land by and, and it was to rest, and they were to. And God said, and we'll, we'll just read it. And each one of these promises revolved around the issue of time. <clears throat> by not buying goods on the Sabbath day and by taking every seventh year off, they were giving their time solely to God. But I ain't got time for that. You know, I got to work. I got a job. I got a business. I got people that depend on me. I got a family. Well, how much faith do you have? How much time do you give toward God and the things that he has, he has commanded us to be a part of and to do? Also, they were saving themselves from a lot of headache. After all, God had strictly commanded them to keep the Sabbath as he had prescribed in Exodus 20, 23, Leviticus 25, 26, Deuteronomy 31. In fact, the captivity from which they were now returning is partly due to the forsaking the Sabbath, as we find in 2 Chronicles 36 and 21, where it says, To fulfill the word of the Lord of the mouth of Jeremiah until the day had enjoyed its Sabbath, all the days that they lay desolate is kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. In other words, there's 70 years and captivity had to do with their forsaking this command. And they seem to understand that pretty well at this point. Seventy years a little bit late. It's hard for me to imagine that they're taking the time that God had given them. After all, God had promised, and up until the harvest of the eighth year, you know, God had promised to give them such bountiful harvest on the sixth year that they would have enough to all the way the harvest of the eighth year. Now think about that. God's going to give, bless them with enough that it will last them all the way to the harvest of the eighth year. But they didn't see it that way. Or maybe they took that great bountiful harvest on the sixth year and said, well, I can make a lot of money from all this. I could sell this. Maybe they were thinking about building bigger barns and or making profit from the great harvest that God had given them instead of saving it up for that seventh year that they would donate to God, that they would give it to God in service to Him. It would sound like a great arrangement. However, they worked instead. Of, they worked instead. They didn't trust God. Was the whole, that's the whole bottom line. They just didn't trust God. Their faith wasn't there. They thought that they could do more with their time than God could. What about us today? You know, we set aside times to worship, to study God's word, maybe to do other great events such as door knock or, or BBS, gospel meetings, lectureships, singings, all these times that we can be together, encourage one another in God's word and singing praises to God and all these great things, all these great works. And, uh, and we don't. Well, I've got to work that day or I forgot to mark that on my calendar or or my kids have a ball game, or, or you know, we've got some reason. Well, I guarantee you, every one of these people in that nation had a some reason that they didn't do that. I've used to ask any one of those Jewish people before this 70 years, from the time they entered Canaan and all the excuses that they started and they grew and they grew and they grew, I'm sure they had just as good excuses as I did, probably even better. But they was just what they were, they were excuses. The, time, the amount of time that we give either communicating to God how important we believe his work is and how important it really is. Let's make sure that we redeem the time, buy it up, to make sure that we've, that's been given us, that we can use it to serve God and to communicate to him how much we love him. You know, communication with God goes a lot further than just prayer. I know that's the way we think about when we talk about communicating with God. We think about praying, talking to Him. 
But our actions every day is the communication to God by our works. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, Make the best of the time because the days are evil. Colossians 4 verse 5, it says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Walk the best, making the best use of our time. Making the best use of our time. He's talking about the wisdom toward outsiders, non-Christians, people that aren't Christians. Everybody that goes up and down this highway today in front of here, they see all these cars out there. Does that have an impression on them? I think it does. And maybe the empty parking spaces makes an impression on them too. Or the way that if they went down to, you know, they went down to Waffle House and they, you know, have got a half parking lot and they'll come back for worship and it's full. What kind of impression does that make? How serious does they take their Bible study? Those are things to think about. Might be something to meditate on a Sunday afternoon. Number three, the tithes that they gave. Now we're getting the need agreed, and now we're talking about a pocketbook. Now I've gone from teaching to meddling, haven't I? That's what most people say when you start talking about their money. <clears throat> Not only do they communicate their high esteem for the Lord's work with their testimony, with their time, but the things that they gave, their tithes that they gave, we find this in verse 32 through 39. Although tithes in the Old Testament practice, it was an Old Testament practice, not a New Testament. We're commanded a little bit different, but we're still to give. <clears throat> there are some things that they, we can learn from their giving. Consider how they gave. They gave purposefully. They had a purpose in their giving. They planned their giving well in advance. In fact, they made laws to cha charge themselves yearly for the service of the house of God. This was funds that were used in, in taking care of the priests and the Levites and, and all the things that went on in worship. So they charged themselves. The amount that they agreed to was one-third of a shekel. Now, if you read back in the book of Exodus, this was somewhat a lesser amount than had been agreed to under the law of Moses. And most agreed that that was because of their poverty that they suffered at this point. You know, up to this point, they'd been under the thumb of these, these people out like Sinballat and Tobiah and all them. They'd, you know, was, uh, they just weren't wealthy people unless they were some of these people that were taking advantage of the situation like some of the nobles had. But most were not that wealthy. But they gave one-third of a shekel just for that purpose. Well, that's not the only thing that they did, so there was other times to give. Likely the amount was lower because of their poverty, as I said, as you know, God has always made provision so that the poor can always participate in the work. Now, listen to that. The poor can always participate in the work. There's nobody that's out. If I'm too poor or, or, or some excuse that I don't participate in the things that God asks us to do, he's made provision for that. Today, our giving is to be purpose and planned also. In the book of 2 Corinthians in verse, chapter 9 and verse 10, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctant or under compulsion, for God loveth a cheerful giver. When we give for the purpose, that's what we're talking about here. I'm giving today because, you know, there's, there's children's homes we support, there's missionaries we support, there's people in preaching school we support. There's, you know, just look at our budget. Look at the good works that go on that you help support. And I'm, you know, y'all are great givers. But we have to take that as an individual and then say that, well, the, we say that, well, Bremen's a great giving church. Well, am I a great giver is what I'm saying. We have to look at it individually. Do I give with a purpose? Do I see when I'm putting that money's in that collection plate, do I see where that money's going? Do I think about what that money's being used for? I think it's helpful. I love to read our missionaries' letters. Brother Waldron and some of the other missionaries, they write these tremendous letters. And, and I would encourage you to look at that board from time to time and just read and see what's being accomplished in the name of the Lord all over this world. And we play a small part in that. And then we get the letters from the preaching students. We put them on this board on the other side, and we see their grades they're making. And we can scoff them if we see them. And from time to time, we'll have one come like we, we had Scott here the other day and uh, see their progress they're making. And it is neat to see, you know, the progress that these men make. And, and the dedication, we've got some men that we're supporting and have supported that quit excellent teaching jobs, accounting jobs, and said, I'm going to preach the gospel. You know, 
I mean, these men are, are doing awfully well for themselves financially and for their family, and I'm going to stop doing that, and I'm going to dedicate my life to God in preaching the gospel. Now, don't you think that took a lot of prayer and thought into making a decision such as that? And that's sort of what these people are saying here with the faith that they're exhibiting right here in this chapter number 10. That I'm going to, Lord, it's in your hands. I'm going to dedicate myself to you. Not only in my, my time and my monies and all my efforts. Let's see where I got to. They gave with a purpose. Too many people today give haphazardly. We open our wallet or at the last minute we write that check and we see what's left over from mama going to buy groceries yesterday. You know, that's the way it works sometimes. Instead of when, you know, when we got that paycheck, even before Uncle Sam gets his, I when Brother Winford Clark was here and he'd always, he'd, when he talked about tithing, which he did, he talked about everything from time to time. He preached the hard stuff pretty regularly. You know, so you don't take that paycheck, a part of that paycheck after Uncle Sam's got his part. You give God before Uncle Sam gets his part. Who, what's first in your life? And that's what we've got to do. We can't wait till all the bills are paid and say, well, God, I'm going to give you what's left over. No, nope, God gets first. They gave sacrificially, verses 35 and 37. They brought their first fruits of everything to God. They did not wait until they had been things that had been eaten or sold off or vegetables that you know they couldn't use or were rotting and give it to God as they did in Malachi number one. They gave to God their very best that they had. What about us? Do we give God our best? And uh, sometimes we don't give God our best. Now, and I think about this in our efforts, in our preparation, not only our giving our, our, out of our, our bank accounts, but in all the other aspects that God expects giving, is it our very best? So, you know, if I'm asked to go teach a class downstairs, did I prepare for that class? Did I do the best job I could? Those, those class members are dependent on you and God's dependent on you too. Can we say we gave them our first fruits? Our attitude should be like that of David at the threshing floor of Arana. I guess I said that, said that right. When, very good. When David was looking for a place to offer sacrifice to the Lord, he came upon this threshing floor and the owner was wanting to give it to him. That's a great cause. I'll just give it to you, David. Nay, but I will surely buy it from thee for a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, that it costs me nothing. It didn't cost me anything. When we give God our leftovers, that's what we're doing. If it didn't sac cause some kind of sacrifice, if I didn't have to do without something to do that, was there really a sacrifice involved in that? Think about that. David wouldn't, he, and he bought the floor and he used it to sacrifice unto God. There's a sermon outline that's by Jim Dearman, and he breaks this verse down into four different sections, and y'all probably heard the sermon before. Number one, he says, I will not offer. That's what many people would say. I just want to, I'm not going to give. Number two, I will not offer unto the Lord. Well, I'll give other things. I'll give to, you know, all the Red Cross and everything. But, you know, at church, I, I'm not going to offer very much there. Number three, I will not offer unto the Lord that which cost me. I'm not going to be sacrificial in my giving. And number four, I will offer unto the Lord which cost, I will not offer unto the Lord that which cost me nothing. That's the sacrificial giving. That's what we want to be. We want to be that one that when my, not only our, our money, but in everything that we do, that it, you know, it's, it's a sacrificial. We made a sacrifice in order to accomplish that. I know the world is drawing us in, in all directions all the time. Our time, you know, the, the, the world just wants our time. That's all it wants is our time. And God demands our time too. And we need to understand that. And at the end of when time is over, when there is no more time, which one's going to matter? Which one's going to really be the one that you care about? It's the time you spent with the Lord. 
The individual like David is willing to give up everything in order to give to God. Of course, this fourth and final attitude is the attitude that all of us must have. They made solemn promises, solemn promises, a covenant, a contract, and communicated to God not to forsake the house of God. What about us? Can God count on me? What are we telling him by my giving? Are we telling him that his work is extremely important or is it really not very important? We are privileged today to read the 10th chapter of Nehemiah. The names of those who communicated the love to God and his cause and their giving, their, their testimony, their time and their tithes. What if there was a list today? What if we were to set a list out to sign for all the men and women and all the believing Christians? And what if God was the one that put the names on there? Would our name be on that list? Would we be willing to sign a list such as that? That's the question. In Luke 21, 4, it says, For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. God is faithful. It took this nation years and years, 70 years in captivity, to start to re-understand that. Let's don't be so foolish to take 70 years to figure out that God is faithful. And everything that he says, all the promises and all the curses, he's just as faithful in one as he is the other. He's not going, you know, he's not going to give apologies to, to all the people that he destroyed in the Old Testament because he said, well, they have it harder in the 21st century than y'all did, so I'm going to apologize. I'm sorry I, you know, I condemned y'all, but these people get a pass. That's not going to happen. We need to take the lessons that we learned from chapters such as this in Nehemiah, and we need to take them to heart. And, uh, and live them out in each day of our lives. Next week. <clears throat> Next week I want you all to read the 11th chapter. We'll be talking about participation. Participation. And I would suggest that you take time to, you know, in, in the 10th chapter, to meditate on the things that we've talked about today. I don't know if you found all that was in that chapter. But you know, when he got to the end of that last name in verse number 27, and it said, The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all that were separated themselves from the people of the land, the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, and all who have knowledge and understanding, joined with their brothers, their nobles, and entered into this curse and oath to walk in God's law that they were given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and to do all commandments of the, God, of the Lord and the Lord and his rules and his statutes. Is that our mindset today? Is that what we want to do? To do all and observe all and to do all God has commanded us to do. If you have any questions, comments? Went by pretty fast, a lot faster than last. Yes, Bob. Exactly. One thing I didn't talk about too was, I want y'all to think about this. When the first time we, we introduced to, and this won't take a second, in, to Nehemiah, think about the relationships that Nehemiah had and cultivated. Number one was his God. What was another relationship he had right quick? The king. That was kind of important, wasn't it? What about what other? When he got to, to Jerusalem, the relationship with the people, even his enemies, Sanballat and Tobiah, and them, you think, well, he didn't have much relationship. He did. He had a tremendous relationship with them. They knew he stood, you know, he stood for God. They knew where he stood. He didn't waver. He didn't compromise. That was extremely important to your enemies to know who you are and what you're about. Relationships, what are relationships that we cultivating today for God's use? Everybody's important. There's not a single person you pass day by day that the relationship you have doesn't matter to God. Think about that too. Thank you very much.